Welcome back to Monitors Unboxed. Today I'm recapping all the monitor news from CES 2024, both stuff announced during the show and in the lead up to give a full breakdown of what you can expect from the monitor market in the early parts of 2024. As expected, CES has been dominated by OLED monitor announcements with a lot of panel formats set to hit the market shortly and even more variants using each of these panels. I'll try to keep track of all of them and make it as easy for you to follow as possible throughout this video, but before we get into it, Today's ad spot is brought to you by Ugreen and their RevoDoc Pro 209 docking station. This little device is your all-in-one solution for hooking up monitors and peripherals to a laptop. Dual 4K display connectors with both HDMI and DisplayPort, three 10 gigabits per second USB ports on the front for easy access and lightning fast data transfer, gigabit ethernet for wired internet, and 100 watts of power delivery support through USB-C without using up an additional port. You simply plug in one cable to your laptop and get all this expanded functionality and connectivity, including Ugreen's DisplayLink technology for extending dual 4K monitors in Windows and Mac OS. To learn more about the RevoDoc Pro 209, check the link in the description below. Let's start with the 32 inch 4K 240Hz QD OLED monitors. There are quite a few of them, but interestingly, they don't all use the exact same variant of this Samsung panel. There are actually multiple versions with the same specs, a flat variant and a curved variant, along with different panel coding treatments, standard glossy or matte. The Dell Alienware AW3225QF is the only announced model so far that uses the curved panel variant with what appears to be a glossy screen coating. The other models from MSI, HP, ASUS, Samsung, Gigabyte all use flat panels, so anyone that prefers a curve at this panel size should go Alienware. I personally tend to dislike curves for 16x9 aspect ratio monitors, and I don't think 32 inches is large enough to justify a curve, which is probably why most monitor vendors are opting for the flat panel, but it'll be interesting to see what the interest is like for the Dell model versus the others. The Samsung Odyssey OLED G8, or G80SD, is the only variant announced so far that's confirmed to use a matte anti-glare coating. This is in addition to the standard QD OLED panel, which Samsung Display provides as a glossy version. The use of a matte panel will likely help prevent mirror-like reflections in brighter usage environments, but probably won't address the typical QD OLED raised black issue, as that's more due to the lack of a polarizer in the panel composition rather than the outer surface coating. Aside from this specific issue, the glossy panel has generally been liked, so it seems like an odd choice to make it matte on the OLED G8, though again, there will be plenty of consumer choice here, you could just opt for a different model. Aside from these two special cases, the other five announced models all use the standard flat glossy panel. There's two models from MSI, the MPG321URX, which you can see a preview of right on this channel, and the MAG321UPX. Both appear largely identical, so I'm not sure what the difference is supposed to be, although MSI tell me the MAG model will be launched later. There's also the HP Omen Transcend 32, and the previously announced ASUS ROG Swift OLED PG32UCDM. Gigabyte have rounded out the pack with a fifth monitor, the Aorus FO32U2P. As all seven of the announced models use the same panel technology, they all have roughly the same specifications. The panel has rated 0.03 millisecond greater gray response times, 250 nits full screen brightness, and 1000 nits peak brightness that shouldn't change too much between units. But that doesn't mean they will perform the same. We've seen with previous QD OLED monitors, there can be differences in HDR accuracy, tuning, and even brightness depending on the configuration. Three of the announced models support Dolby Vision content, the Alienware AW3225QF, the Omen Transcend, and the ROG Swift PG32UCDM. I had seen some rumours that ASUS cancelled the UCDM QD OLED variant, but that's not true. And this leaves the MSI and Samsung models without DV support, though that's pretty standard for Samsung. Gigabyte hasn't announced every spec yet, so DV support is a bit unclear there. Most models come with DisplayPort 1.4 using DSC to achieve 4K 240Hz. Some people have complained about this, but from a monitor standpoint, there should be effectively no difference in image quality or performance between a DP 1.4 with DSC implementation and DP 2.1, and the use of DP 1.4 could actually be beneficial as it should work better with longer or lower quality DisplayPort cables due to the lower bandwidth being sent through the cable. Most of the complaints with DSC are related to NVIDIA's janky 
key GPU implementation which isn't supported with some of their GPU features, which as I've said previously is not a monitor issue, it's an NVIDIA issue and it should be on NVIDIA to offer full DSC support, not the monitor vendors to offer a workaround if it's otherwise not required. With that said, there is one model that will support DisplayPort 2.1 with the full UHBR20 bandwidth, the Gigabyte Aorus FO32 U2P, which they're claiming is a world first. I'm very curious to see how this implementation is achieved given the lack of available DP2.1 scalers right now. It's either using the, I guess, very latest hardware or a custom solution. Pricing for these 32-inch 4K QD OLEDs is confirmed to start at $1,200. That pricing has been announced for both the MSI MPG321 URX and the Alienware AW3225QF. The Alienware model is hitting the market first in North America on January 11th. The MSI model is launching in several regions, including North America and Europe, in February. I expect most variants to hit the market in the first quarter of the year. The 27-inch 1440p 360Hz QD OLED panel has been announced in five monitors so far, the Dell Alienware AW2725DF, the Samsung Odyssey OLED G60SD, the Gigabyte Aorus FO27Q3, and both the MPG271QRX and MAG271QPX from MSI. Samsung Display are offering flat and curved variants of this panel, but all five announced so far are making the sensible decision to choose the flat panel for this size and aspect ratio, though we are a bit unsure about the Gigabyte, not too much known about that one. Samsung, like with their 32-inch 4K monitor, are choosing to apply a matte anti-glare coating on top of the QD OLED panel. The other four should be standard QD OLED glossy. Again, we're expecting similar specifications across the five variants, 0.03 millisecond rate of response times, 250 nits full screen brightness, and 1000 nits peak brightness, 99% DCI-P3 color gamut coverage. None of the announced models support Dolby Vision, not even the Alienware model. However, I did spot the AW2725DF claiming to use HDMI 2.1, even though it offers HDMI 2.0 class bandwidth, which is a bit misleading. You will still be limited to 144Hz over HDMI on that monitor. The only variant we have a confirmed price and release date for is the Alienware model, which will be available in North America on January 11th at $900 US. That seems like a pretty respectable price and will put a lot of pressure on existing 1440p 240Hz W OLED monitors, many of which sit in the $800 to $1,000 US price range. Given what we've seen from these displays so far, I think we'll see those existing W OLEDs drop in price as they just won't be able to compete with a higher refresh rate QD OLED. These displays are also the first QD OLEDs to feature a 16 by 9 aspect ratio with a 1440p resolution, so it'll be interesting to see how they compare to W OLED. Moving now to W OLEDs, and at CES we saw a range of new monitors announced featuring many different panel configurations, the most eye-catching of which is the 32-inch 4K 240Hz panel that offers dual-mode functionality, meaning it can also run at a 1080p resolution at a higher 480Hz refresh rate. This is a feature that we haven't seen before and will offer a key point of difference to the equivalent QD OLED monitors we've just been talking about. Aside from the ability to run at 1080p 480Hz, the use of W OLED means a different pixel structure that offers different text clarity. I'm yet to get hands on time with the W OLED panel to see how it looks, but the QD OLED has great text clarity, so hopefully the same can be said of W OLED. Also, crucially, the W OLED panel's different layer structure means it reflects significantly less ambient light, producing lower apparent blacks in brighter viewing environments. That could be tempting for buyers that use their OLED for gaming during the day. However, we're expecting monitors using this panel to be available later in the year, with the QD OLED equivalents launching first. There are two monitors announced to be using this panel so far, the ASUS ROG Swift OLED PG32 UCDP and the LG 32GS 95UE. Yes, ASUS will be offering both a W OLED and QD OLED monitor with very similar specs, the difference in naming being the UCDP for W OLED and the UCDM for QD OLED. Both the ASUS and LG versions that use the W OLED panel will be using an anti-glare low reflection coating, which is code for a matte finish of some sort. I'm expecting it to be similar to what we saw for most W OLED desktop monitors released in 2023, like the LG 27GR95QE. This could be another key deciding factor for buyers tossing up between QD OLEDs, which are largely offered as glossy monitors, and W OLED. The panel used here is what LG describes as 3rd gen W OLED with MLA. Not sure what qualifies for the other two generations, but we'll go with it. 
As these monitors are launching later than the QD OLEDs, ASUS say the second half of 2024, there are fewer specs to go on. However, LG claim a 0.03 millisecond greater gray response time and 99% DCI-P3 coverage, while ASUS are claiming up to 1300 nits of peak brightness. It's possible that higher brightness will only be seen on the ASUS model rather than a general panel characteristic, as their 27-inch 1440p W OLED was notably brighter than the other variants using the same panel. ASUS are also saying no Dolby Vision support for their W OLED monitor. While Dolby Vision will be available for their QD OLED, we are seeing DisplayPort 1.4 on both monitors as well for similar reasons as described earlier. In 2024, we'll see a 27-inch 1440p 480Hz W OLED panel from LG as well, which so far will be used in one announced monitor, the ASUS ROG Swift PG27 AQDP. We're also expecting this to be used in a monitor from LG at some point in the future, but they've only teased the panel at this point. Anyway, ASUS are claiming similar specs to the 4K W OLED panel, so 1300 nits peak brightness and 99% coverage of DCI-P3, though this time with a glossy finish. ASUS are expecting to release it in the second half of 2024, so it's still a little way off. While the 4K 240Hz and 1440p 480Hz W OLEDs are probably of most interest to buyers, coming to market sooner are new W OLED ultrawides. Specifically, we're getting a new 34-inch 3440x1440-240Hz panel and a 39-inch 3440x1440-240Hz panel. The 34-inch panel is a direct competitor to QD OLEDs that hit the market starting in 2022, and the first W OLED at this common ultra-wide size, the previous versions being 45 inches. The new 39-inch panel offers the same specs as the 34-inch panel, but at a larger size, and in fact, I quite like the 38-39-inch type of size for an ultra-wide. The downside, of course, is the lower pixel density versus the 34-inch panel, as the resolution is the same, but it shouldn't be as bad as previous previous 45-inch panels that were also 3440 by 1440. So far, there have been six monitors announced that are using the new 34 and 39-inch W OLED panels, two each from LG, Asus, and Acer. From LG, we have the 39GS95QE and 34GS95QE. From Asus, the ROG Swift OLED PG39WCDM and ROG Swift OLED PG34WCDM. And from Acer, the Predator X39 and Predator X34X. So each brand will be offering a 34 and 39 9-inch variant. As the panels are very similar, the main specifications are expected to be the same across the six monitors. All three brands list 99% DCI-P3 coverage, while LG and ASUS rate the display for 0.03 millisecond response times. Acer claims a faster 0.01 millisecond response, but realistically they should all deliver the same OLED performance we've seen previously. These are also 1800R curved panels, which is quite a significant curve, and that's the same whether you get the 34-inch or larger 39-inch models. For reference, 34-inch QD OLED panels are 1800R, so the W OLED equivalent is more than twice as curved. Acer and LG are not making brightness claims yet, but ASUS are claiming 1300 nits for both sizes at a 3% window size, which is the same brightness claims made for their other 2024 W OLED monitors. Again, it's not clear whether this is a general spec for these panels or ASUS specific, given they have pushed brightness higher with some of their previous displays. At this stage, Acer have the most information on offer. They are saying the Predator X34X will cost $1300 and launch in North America and Europe in the second quarter of 2024. Also launching in Q2 is the Predator X39 at a higher $1,500 US price point. Both will be available slightly earlier in Q1 in China. Meanwhile, ASUS have not provided pricing for their monitors yet, but both should launch in Q1 of 2024. In fact, I have the PG34 WCDM in for testing. You should see that review very shortly, which suggests a wide launch quite soon. Also of note is that ASUS OLED monitors using W OLED panels will feature black frame insertion BFI technology. This feature is labeled as ELMB, similar to their LCD monitors with backlight strobing. Essentially, it works by showing a black frame every second frame to improve motion clarity, though this does halve the effective refresh rate of the display. For example, on a 240Hz monitor, ELMB would work at 120Hz with the actual 240Hz output displaying a black frame every second frame. It has quite a few limitations like the need to operate at a fixed refresh rate, but for motion clarity purists, it's a step in the right direction as BFI hasn't been utilized on many OLEDs previously. Several other monitors have been announced around CES that are either refreshes of existing products 
or are a new brand using an existing panel. For example, LG are refreshing their 45 inch 3440 by 1440 ultra wide OLED with the 45GS95QE and the 45GS96QB, both of which appear very similar except for the QB model packing built-in speakers. They are also refreshing their 27-inch 1440p 240Hz W OLED from last year, the 27GR95QE, as a new model, which is the 27GS95QE. Specifications appear the same as last year's model, so it's unclear what has changed. MSI are refreshing their 34-inch QD OLED as the MAG341 CQP. This monitor is set to use a second-gen QD OLED panel instead of first-gen at the same 3440x1440 resolution. The MPG491 CQP should also come out soon, offering a 49-inch 5120x1440 resolution at 144Hz, so an equivalent to the ASUS PG49WCD. Samsung are refreshing the Odyssey OLED G9 with a new variant, the G95SD, the the original version is the G95SC. It looks to be using the same panel as the original version with minor tweaks. We'll also be seeing this 49 inch QD OLED panel deployed in models from AOC and Gigabyte, the Gigabyte model at 144Hz and the AOC model at 240Hz. The AOC is supposed to be already available while the Gigabyte is coming later. Cooler Master are launching a 27 inch 1440p 240Hz W OLED in Q1 as well using what appears to be the same panel we've seen in models throughout 2023. Gigabyte joined in the party with some other OLED announcements, although it's unclear on exact specifications given the extremely limited information they've provided so far. There's an Aorus FO32U2 model, not to be confused with the FO32U2P, which is either a variant of the QD OLED model or a version that uses the 32-inch W OLED panel instead. There's also the Aorus MO34WQC and MO34WQC2, unclear what the difference is between the models. While most of the news at CES has been focused on OLED monitors, there has been a bit of LCD news as well. Acer are launching the Predator Z57, packing a 32x9 super ultrawide 7680x2160 VA panel with a 2304 zone mini LED backlight. This is an equivalent to the Samsung Odyssey Neo G95NC, but interestingly the zone count is different, Acer quoting 2304 to Samsung's 2392. The Acer model is also just 120Hz compared to 240Hz from Samsung. I honestly don't think this model looks very appealing at all, because Acer will be offering it for $2500 US when it launches in Q2. That's the same MSRP as the Samsung 57 inch equivalent that offers a higher refresh rate, and often the Samsung Samsung model drops to $2,000 US. Lastly, we have NVIDIA's announcement of G-Sync Pulsar. This is NVIDIA's version of technology that allows you to use backlight strobing and variable refresh rate simultaneously, which we've seen from several other brands over the years now, such as ASUS with ELMB Sync and Gigabyte with AIM Stabilizer Sync. Rather than calling it something a bit clumsy, like ULMB2 Sync, they've decided to brand this extension and next iteration of ULMB as Pulsar. What NVIDIA are claiming to have made with Pulsar is a strobing plus VRR solution that's superior to other brands. For example, NVIDIA says that strobing the backlight at a frequency that is not fixed causes serious flicker, which until now had prevented effective use of the technique in VRR displays. I'm not sure how accurate that statement is, as implementations like ELMB Sync and AIM Stabilizer Sync don't have serious flicker issues. However, I would agree those techniques haven't been all that effective. Usually what previous solutions have done is strobe the backlight multiple times per refresh, which doesn't produce an image as clear as non-synced strobing, especially at lower refresh rates. So I guess when NVIDIA later says, prior attempts have often stumbled, leading to flickering and diminished motion clarity, that's probably a slightly better way to put it. Anyway, what NVIDIA are claiming here is a technology that ensures perfect synchronization between overdrive and backlight pulse with the screen's refresh cycle. By adaptively tuning backlight pulses in response to the constantly changing game render rate, G-Sync Pulsar creates a consistent and comfortable viewing experience, effectively accommodating the display's dynamic nature. It sounds like a more advanced version of what other brands have previously attempted, hopefully using a single strobe no matter the refresh rate, along with on-the-fly adjustments to the strobe depending on the refresh rate. NVIDIA says this technology requires the use of a new panel, so it won't be available through a software update on existing monitors like was possible with ULMB2. 
The first products to use Pulsar will be from ASUS, an upcoming ROG Swift PG27 series product, which appears to be some sort of 27-inch 1440p 360Hz IPS. Based on our discussions with NVIDIA, Pulsar is designed for LCDs that have a backlight as opposed to OLEDs that for a similar effect use black frame insertion instead of backlight strobing. This is reinforced by NVIDIA's blog post which discusses the incorporation of adaptive overdrive into the technology, something that isn't required on an OLED. Unfortunately though, it sounds like the G-Sync module hasn't received significant hardware updates to incorporate Pulsar. The technology will require a G-Sync module, but NVIDIA told us that it hasn't been updated with long requested features like HDMI 2.1. We can expect to learn more about Pulsar later in the year when the first monitors arrive using the technology. Anyway, lots of news from CES 2024 on the monitor front. It feels like the industry is gearing up for a massive year of OLED monitor releases for high-end shoppers. I know some people will be looking over these announcements with a ton of excitement and will try to review as many of these monitors as possible, but it's also important to remember that CES announcements are typically skewed towards high-end products. There will still be plenty of budget-oriented monitors released in 2024, and I'd expect OLEDs to push into lower price categories as well, given the emergence of new panels and formats. Anyway, that's it for this news recap video. If you're interested in these monitors and are looking forward to reviews, the best way to do that is subscribe to the channel so you don't miss them. We should be starting with the 34-inch W OLED ultrawides right up on this channel very soon, and then QD OLEDs, 32-inch, those sorts of things in the months to follow. I know the 32-inch Alienware is available in North America very soon. Not sure when it's launching here, so our review might not be available in January like you may see from people that are in North America, but we will try and review that product as soon as possible. Also, if you're interested in supporting Monitors Unboxed to buy some of the monitors talked about in this news video, for example, the Samsung monitors, I pretty much expect they'll have to buy those because Samsung doesn't really talk to us all that much these days. If you do want to support us to buy those products, then... Patreon float plan is a great way to do that and to support our independent testing. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.